Good morning, St. Simons. What a joy to be here with you today online. I have to say I miss singing in church most of all. So I hope I haven't annoyed my dog too badly by how much I've been singing along in my basement here. Today, I wanna to talk about what I think is one of the most arresting images in scripture, at least for me this year. That image of Moses at the top of the mountain, looking out on the promised land, the land he's worked to get his people towards for 40 years in this desert, the land he's only dreamed about, could only imagine. Now he sees it and God says, it's not for you. You won't be going there. I think this image gets me in particular this year because of how much this pandemic has felt like a desert. It feels like a time of wandering, does it not? And it's maybe starting to feel like it's been about 40 years. I know too that the reality of death is all too present these days for too many of us. We mourn for those who should have lived long and healthy lives like Moses. And to compound it all, our mourning rites, our rituals, our being together like the Israelites in the desert have been taken away from us too. We may find ourselves in this story weeping with the Israelites. But come with me for a moment to the top of that mountain peak with Moses. Maybe you can identify with him really readily. Maybe you are the exhausted leader of a family, of an organization, or even just your own darn self. I think all of us practice leadership every day when we get ourselves out of bed. You're sick and tired of the complaining, the cajoling, the encouraging, and the discipline that it takes to get anybody through a desert or even up out of bed. Maybe you think that Moses weeps with exhaustion and frustration in this moment. But of course, that's not in the text. That's a bit of creative exegesis. And maybe it's not entirely faithful exegesis. The text tells us, of course, that we are not Moses, and I'm thankful for that. And we are not Moses because I'm making an assumption, but I'm guessing that few of us were born to an enslaved woman. Few of us were destined for death by Pharaoh's commandment. Maybe for Moses, there's much more hope in this moment. Maybe to see that promised land, just to know for real and for certain that it's right there. Maybe that feels like enough. For Moses, it tells him that his journey has not been in vain, that the promises God made to him are real and are coming true just before his eyes. That's hope right there, right? To be able to see it, even from a distance, to see the promised land. Although maybe it's a more desperate kind of hope than we're used to talking about. I do like today how the collision of lectionary texts causes us to read this passage of Deuteronomy in light of what Jesus says is the greatest commandment, to love your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, with everything that is in you, and to love your neighbor just like that, just like yourself. It's a perfect retort to the Pharisees because what he's doing is quoting the law that they know very well. Now, this is probably most accurately a quote from Leviticus from the first time that the law is given in the desert, but it's given again in Deuteronomy. This is your Bible fact for the day. Deuteronomy comes from a Greek term that means a copy of the law. And this time when the law is given again in Deuteronomy, there's a huge emphasis on exactly what Jesus is talking about, on loving your neighbor. Now there's a real practical edge to this in the desert in Deuteronomy. When you're in a desert, loving your neighbor becomes all the more vital because your neighbor is just about the only thing that's out there with you. The desert is a barren and a harsh place. Your neighbor is whatever member of the community is next to you because they might be the thing that's standing between you and the abyss. In the desert, loving your neighbor is not always easy, but it's often the easy choice because you don't really have any other options. 
in the desert, in these scriptures, God puts the choice before the Israelites again and again. God says, I've put before you life and death. Death and life, which means choosing to love and follow God, which means choosing to love and follow along with your neighbor. And your neighbor, in case you're wondering, is really just whoever ends up camped next to you in the campsite that day or in the caravan for that next morning. Here in the desert, these scriptures we're reading are where the Israelites receive the law and where they learn to live together and be with one another in community. That law enables them to love one another in real and practical ways. And that law will make God's love visible in them, even as they go into the promised land. I think then that we can think about Moses being formed in that kind of love, that group project kind of love, as I heard someone call it recently. And if he was so formed in those 40 years in the desert by that kind of love, that kind of disciplined, real, material love, I wonder, I wonder if for Moses it was actually okay that he wasn't himself going to make it to the promised land. Because he knew that that land was real. He could see it. And he knew that the next guy was going to make it. And maybe that was actually good enough. Maybe on the top of that mountain, Moses wept to behold the beauty of that land and wept with relief and with joy that all of his struggle, all of his striving, all of his leadership in that desert was worth it because someone was going to make it. Some one of his neighbors in that camp was going to make it. We read in this passage of how Moses passed the mantle to Joshua. And what I'm suggesting is that Moses might love Joshua so fiercely that Moses loves Joshua as himself. And because loving Joshua is loving himself, to know that Joshua makes it into the promised land is just as good for Moses as making it himself. Again, Moses sees that land in the distance for the first time with his own eyes, and he knows that it is real. And he knows that even if he doesn't make it, someone else will because of what he did. And that's hope too, isn't it? Maybe a more expansive communal kind of hope than we're used to talking about. But I think in the end, that's why I get stuck on this image, the image of Moses standing on the mountain and seeing that promised land. It doesn't have to be just a sad image, although there is great sadness to it, but it really is a picture of a kind of hope, a kind of hope that we might need right now, a shakier, more communal, more difficult kind of hope, not the kind of hope that's summed up in greeting cards, but the kind of hope that allows you to survive in a desert place and a desert time. And I do think, my friends, that we are in a desert place and a desert time. In this pandemic, in our political climate, and in our literal climate, which we see changing all around us. I wonder then what it would mean for us to take up this hope of Moses for us to take up this command of Jesus, to love our neighbor like we have seen the promised land, like we know for real that it is possible, that we understand that God's promises are coming true right in front of our very eyes, like we believe that the kingdom of heaven has come very near. What would it mean to love your neighbor so dearly, so tightly, in such a real and material way that it is just as good if that guy makes it as if you do? What would it mean to love your neighbor so hard that they would be okay after you're gone? I wonder if that would change how you live in this pandemic or change how you're participating in our political process this year. 
Would it change how you think about treating the planet? What would it be like? What would it be like to love your neighbor? And remember, your neighbor is just whoever's closest to you in the campground this particular day. What would it be like to love that neighbor with the vision of the promised land in front of you? Knowing that you might not make it, but the next guy will. That's a kind of love that's sometimes difficult to talk about. It's not the kind of love that you'll find on a Hallmark card for Sweetest Day. It's a shakier, riskier, more communal kind of love than we're used to talking about or practicing. But I believe that's the kind of love that Moses practiced out there in the desert. And I believe that it's the kind of love that Jesus calls us to. And I believe that it's the only kind of love that will lead us out of this desert. Amen.